Welcome, Tommy Sands, uh, to uh, the fireside here in Rostrever. Uh, Tommy is my neighbor, Tommy and Katrine, and um, your brother Colm and Barbara, and also Anne and John just down the road. So there's a good Sands family contingent uh, in, in Rostrever. And it's one of the things we, Jen and I, moved here um, nearly 10 years ago, and I think one of the best things i think the things we're most grateful for is for the friendship with with yourself tommy and your family so sam here johnny yeah, it is yeah. very important you, you all come in here and uh, yeah. to us all here yeah yeah no, it's been uh it's been wonderful to to kind of have a friendship over these years and uh and i suppose over these 10 years i've learned to appreciate the kind of um the role you've played over here for many years in, in northern ireland and in our uh, throughout the country, throughout the island of Ireland and around the world as you've traveled and sung songs. Um, Tommy Sands is very much, in some ways, I suppose you could say he's the, he's the voice of Irish folk music, with others, of course, and but he's also been a, an important voice of peace in, in, our, in our history. And so it's great to have you sitting here for the Guardians of the Flame podcast. And uh, I think we're just going to chat a bit for the next hour or so and see what we stumble upon as we talk and uh, kind of hear, reminisce over your bit of your past and the journey you've been on. So thanks, Tommy, for being with us. Delighted, delighted, Johnny. And that's a, a good fire you have on, on a cold uh, <laughs> yeah. afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jen lit it, but I needed to, you know, tweak it a wee bit, you know. She's Let the circle be wider on the fireside and we'll soon make room for you. Let your heart have no fear, for there's no strangers here, just friends that you never knew. We will travel along on the wings of a song, with a mind that is open and free. If we close our eyes to the other side, we're just half of what we could be. So let the circle be wide on the fireside. It's, it's good to be here. Yeah. Yeah, I love that song, uh, Let the Circle Be Wide. Uh, we use it in documentary, and you you seem to have a way of, of bringing people together. Um, is that something you learned from from your home? Kind of, did you did you learn that as a child? Where, how do you learn to, to do that, to bring groups together? I mean, I've seen you sing that song here with 30 religious leaders from Christian, Muslim, Jewish backgrounds, and I've seen you do it in front of hundreds of people. Um, how, how do you get shaped to become the person that kind of sing, that gathers people like that? I suppose my first my first memory, I suppose, uh, of uh, a memory that keeps with me is uh, awakening to the power of music by my mother singing me to sleep. Mm. And uh, I suppose that's the first example of where a, so a song could do what it was intended to do, like mm. a lullaby. Mm. And I remember lying in bed and my mother would sing a uh, daily, daily, sing to Mary. Do, 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 do. I used to wonder who... Why was she singing to Mary? Mary's my sister. She wasn't even in the bed, for God's sake. <laughs> but my brother Hugh is in the bed. Mm -hmm. And Hugh didn't want to sleep because he mm -hmm. knew something I didn't know that was going to happen that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say, if you pretend you're asleep, she'll stop singing. <laughs> but the, the reason, uh, then my mother would sing on and then slowly she would tiptoe out of the room mm -hmm. and then we would hear this music coming from leaking underneath the kitchen door into the bedroom accompanied by the flicker of an oil lamp and uh, that was the reason Hugh knew and I didn't but I soon knew and uh, the uh, I suppose it would have been more I felt it more sinful to sleep than to be awake when the neighbours came in with fiddles under their arms and black bottles squeaking in their inside pockets. Mm -hmm. And uh, the music that's been played had as much of a Scottish snap as an Irish lilt because 
in fact, people came from both sides of mm. the community. Mm. And uh, I think that is my earliest memories mm -hmm. of music. And then w when I grew up, i uh, been able to take part in it in some way, even very young. I saw all these feet tapping to the same rhythm, mm -hmm. regardless of the political uh, mm -hmm. persuasion or religious affiliation. And I realized at a very early age that music was something that could connect up the secret and the sacred things inside us without our without our knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it it started that way, and uh, mm -hmm. really th that influenced me an awful lot. Mm -hmm. When later it came to a situation of having an opportunity, maybe to create situations where uh, enemies could come together and. Uh, coming into a situation where music created neighborliness mm -hmm. and they could uh, talk more easily. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suppose that, that was the beginning mm. of it. So earliest memories was hearing music coming out of your kitchen under your doors, your family and neighbors, and your parents would have been farmers of, of some kind or would have yes. had a farm? Or? Yes, we had a small farm yeah. and uh, my father played a fiddle. My mother played the accordion. Uh, my uh, my mother's father was a poet, a local poet, and these poems are still recited in Burn near Warm Point. And uh, my mother wrote songs too. Uh, sure, it's up the Carrick Road we go and run by Charlie Grant's. If you want to go for a good night's dance, and in the Valley Hall, boys, and in the Valley Hall, girls. You surely will enjoy dancing round the floor with the Broxtown boy. A Broxtown boy, a Broxtown boy, dancing round the floor with the Broxtown boy. Now, my father went to that dance as well. <laughs> and uh, one, one night, I think maybe the important night in question, the band didn't turn up. <laughs> and my father could play the fiddle. So he had paid, I think, fourpence to get in. Right. So they asked him if he'd play the fiddle for the dance, which he did. And at the end, they give him back his fourpence. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a very generous mood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my mother and father uh, walked out through the door, hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And they, in many ways, uh, their, their meeting was uh, sort of forged through music in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. And they... Uh, so that is, that is yeah. how that happened. And then uh, the both of them welcomed people into the house, uh, rambling musicians, rambling people who were just rambling about the place. Mm. And uh, sometimes they stayed for an hour, sometimes they stayed for a week. Wow. And just kind of following your trajectory, a little bit of your own life, and, and, and uh, some of you listening will have known Tommy Sands as a singer, musician, and many of you listening will also know of his family, the Sands family, who've released many CDs over the years. Um, but so coming from that kind of a farmhouse in Mayo Bridge, um, uh, yeah, what the trajectory you took was initially, like many young Catholic boys, you went in and studied to be a priest uh, down in Carlo, I think you said, yes. yeah. How, why did you do that and then how how why did you leave that and obviously decide not to go that journey that direction well as you say it was uh, it wasn't unusual for uh, young catholic lads at that time to have ambitions uh, for the priesthood and the, the whole community would be uh, tuned into that uh, in fact both sides of the community mm. Uh, my uncle, uh, I had three uncles who were priests. One went to Africa, one went to the Philippines, and one went to China. And uh, my uncle worked for the local Protestant farmer, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mentioned at some time or other that he would like to go back to school. He's about 16 mm -hmm. and uh, studied to be a priest. Mm. And uh, James Glennie was his name. Glennie says, I don't believe in your church, he says, but I believe in you. Mm. And he he helped him greatly mm -hmm. uh, financially to go back to school. 
and uh, my uncle was I come from the town land of Ryan or Rain. Mm -hmm. Rain uh, it means a path or a way. Uh, the town land itself is three miles long and just 300 yards wide. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rain, uh, Ismisha and Rain would, would be the Irish translation of I am the way. Mm. But anyway, uh, my uncle Hugh, he was the the only man from the Ryan Road who had met Mao Tse Tung. Mm. Wow. Uh, maybe the only man from any road in Ireland. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, well, he was his prisoner. Uh, Mao was the leader of the guerrilla gang that captured him and held him for ransom. And uh, eventually they, they, became, they became good friends as much as you could become a good friend <laughs> looking through a cage mm -hmm. with each other. But uh, he, used to, he used to talk about the philosophical and religious discussions and all those things. And uh, Mao said to my uncle, he said, where do you come from? My uncle said, Ireland. That's England, isn't it? <laughs> no, said my uncle. Ireland's an independent nation. Mm -hmm. And Mao smiled, if it was a smile, and he said, no country on the edge of an empire is an independent nation. Mm. Wow. And uh, that's one of the things he, he told me. He, he had some great discussions with him. In fact, there's a very beautiful book written about his time there called Red, Behind the Red Lacquered Gate by a man called William E. Barrett, mm. uh, who wrote The Lilies of the Field. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they came with a ransom for him and uh, he... Uh, there's an old Franciscan monk lying in the corner in bad health. And uh, my uncle says, where is his ransom? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the prisoner, prison guard said, no, he has no money for him. Uh, he stays, you go. So my uncle, my uncle says, no, I'll go, let him stay. And the rest of his time there would affect him for the rest of his life. And when he arrived home, he was... Uh, his mind wasn't uh, totally together by any means. He thought he was still in China mm -hmm. and he would wake up in the middle of the night and we would hear him and sca he would scare mm -hmm. us with uh, shouting in Chinese mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, nothing could persuade him that he was back in Ireland until a man arrived from County Meath, a writer and a poet and a... Uh, he would have been in, elected to the second Dáil, second parliament in, in Ireland, a man called Brian O'Higgins, who's a songwriter, and his brother Frank, who's a fiddle player. But he started to sing a song for my mm. uncle that he had written. It went, uh, A storm a cree when you're far away from the home you will soon be leaving And it's many a time By night and by day That your heart it will be sorely grieving For the stranger's land May be bright and fair And rich in his treasures golden You'll pine, I know for the long, long ago And the love that is never leaving And when he finished that song Something happened Or contributed to it uh, Bringing him back Which medicine mm. didn't do So mm. these were the things where I saw Music being very important And I suppose uh, like many a one, I headed off to uh, search, uh, learn. I went to a seminary in Carlo, one of the oldest, the oldest seminary in Ireland. I loved the place. And uh, it was great crack, uh, a great mm -hmm. place to play hurling and football, rugby, mm -hmm. to uh, learn songs, play music, 
playing a band, learn philosophy, psychology, theology. What beautiful things we learn. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it is all, I, I think, I, you know, I don't regret leaving the place, but I certainly don't re- regret going in there okay, either. Yeah. And uh, remember when I decided to leave, and I'm still circling that the reason for that, and probably always will in a way. But in a way, I didn't leave that idea of trying to learn and trying to contribute uh, whatever tuppence hapenny I could contribute in whatever field it happened to be. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming home, and the folks at home didn't know I was leaving. Mm-hmm. And in those days, it wasn't easy to leave. Mm. Uh, I decided that I'd have to think and I'd have to walk. So I began walking. I was coming from Dublin to Newry. And uh, up until that point, I knew what I was going to do. Everything was very simple. Mm. It had been very easy to continue on that mm. road. But uh, I was looking over, over the hedges and I saw men working at hay. Mm. And I wondered, will I be working at hay? And I saw men up telegraph poles with pliers in their mouths fixing things. And I said, will I be doing something like that? And I walked on and cars stopped to give me a lift. But whenever you don't want a lift, that's the time the cars will stop. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, thanks. Uh, I want to walk. And uh, I walked on and uh, eventually I came to within a few miles of the nearest town, home, hometown, Newry. Mm-hmm. And I I don't know where I was looking, but I heard the noise of a car stopping. And uh, I prepared to say, no, thanks. Mm-hmm. And it was a car going in the opposite direction. Colm was in there. All the family were in there. Rolled on the the pane of glass or the, the window sill or the window of the car. And he said, he didn't ask me, where are you going or what are you doing? He said, we've got your guitar in the back. We're doing a gig in Gormanstown mm. for the the refugees who were burnt out of Belfast. Mm-hmm. Uh, will, do you want to come? I said, yes. Mm. So in a way that yes was after uh, mm. wandering uh, if you like and uh, we we never had any that was the beginning of the troubles we had played before that mm. uh, and uh, I suppose the birth pangs of the provisional IRA the, uh, all those uh, things that were happening at the time so I really just kept on playing after that and uh, mm. we got together well we were always together anyway we never had a plan. We never had any business plan. We mm. never even thought more than what's going to happen mm-hmm. next week. Mm-hmm. We rarely even thought of it next mm. week. Mm. A- and uh, so the, uh, then that's how it wow. started. Wow. So you kind of walked home from, what, 70, 80 miles south yeah. of here? And uh, that's quite a walk, you know? It uh, was, but it, it, it didn't feel like long at all. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I was... I had been used to, I loved the, I must say I loved the seminary. I loved the the, the music of the organ. There was a, a man called uh, Mr. Sildreers. He was a Flemish Belgian and a wonderful musician. Uh, Sildreers, they called him Steel Drawers. He has mm-hmm. any pupils will give mm-hmm. a slightly different name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he used to play a lot of Bach. Mm. sacred music and the harmonies coming out was incredible mm. and I used to look up at the ceiling and there were frescoes of some sort in the ceiling but coming home I was looking up at the sky mm-hmm. and realised this is the roof of mm. the church that I belong to mm. and the walls were the horizons wow. and the that's where I started to feel most comfortable. Mm. Wow. And um, and so you, you then started uh, producing CDs, or <laughs> not CDs back then, um, LPs, LPs. Rec- records, and mm-hmm. 
touring and uh, touring in Europe and, and around the world. When did when, you've now written? You've written songs of all shapes and sizes, all kinds about all of human existence, I suppose. But particularly in the area of peace and reconciliation, uh, you've written a few songs over the years that really touched on those on that issue, like the music of healing or there were roses about the story of two friends that were killed near you on the Ryan Road. Um, one a Protestant, one a Catholic. Uh, when, I mean. It sounds silly to say why did you write those songs, but I suppose not everyone would go into that kind of to write about that. What, was there something in you that that has a desire to kind of bring people together? Or? Well, I I never set out to write political songs at all, although many would regard them as political. Maybe political songs in the Greek sense of that word, mm. people songs, songs about mm. people. Mm. And uh, up until the Troubles, you know, I was singing the songs uh, my parents had sung about immigration, mm -hmm. songs about pretty fair maids in the month of May or mm -hmm. even June. Mm -hmm. But when it became July and August in, in our growing and pretty fair maids were amongst those being maimed and killed and mm -hmm. uh, sent to graves and sent to prisons, I, I felt it was time to write new songs. Mm. And I think one of the very first songs I, I wrote, if you can remember a little bit of it, it was actually recorded by another group, Brian McCollum group, while I was still at college actually. Okay. And we weren't allowed radios in the college. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed newspapers either. <laughs> but I made a radio, uh, somebody helped me, which could be rigged up inside a tape recorder. And I listened to the Gay Byrne radio program, mm. and the song has been played, and there's a great feeling. I hate to hear people cry. One is for sorrow, two is for joy. And love is a dove that needs two wings to fly. That is the chorus of it. Mm. Mm. And uh, then, I suppose. With the uh, troubles at home, uh, civil rights uh, quickly became part of that. It's the most natural thing to do. Mm -hmm. Students all over the world were marching. Because mm, Martin Luther King was marching in America. Yes. That was catching on around the world and it caught on over here. Yes. And so you were getting caught up. Many people uh, would have been caught up with, there wasn't some kind of injustice going on here. The, the, we, you weren't an equal society. Yes. Exactly. So it was very natural to kind of get... The American Civil Rights Movement would have greatly influenced mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the music, the early music of the Civil Rights Movement we had here. Uh, of course, like... Uh, songs like that mm -hmm. came through Joan Baez and Pete, Pete Seeger. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Then I remember in Yuri one night there were three young men shot. I gone to school with two of them, and uh, the army had blacked out the town, and the civil rights leaders had asked us to go in and sing a song in the in the darkness. And I remember we did that, and. Uh, give people some encouragement when they come back on the street and start to sing with us. That is about oh, very early on, early 70s. The world will hear our call Civil rights for all It's singing from the rooftops It is written on Walls. A job, no, a house where we can live, a job to pay the bills, a vote to give us hope for the future of our children. We'll sing it all over, we'll sing it down under, we'll sing it wherever we can. 
In mountains and highways and valleys and byways We'll sing it all over the land I haven't sung that song for a long time <laughs> But it was a song which was uh, pointing out the reasons for it Because at that time, in the early days, Protestants in the civil rights movement it was a uh, mainly Protestant organisation who were very much behind the equality in the first place. And, of course, various other groups, uh, Republican groups and various other uh, uh, people who were looking for change. And uh, so th that was a song, that song in the streets, and then there were concerts for people who were... Uh, and during term, and people imprisoned without any trial, and most of them were most of them were actually innocent. So we did concerts to raise money for the uh, the relatives, Balance families. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, th then, as uh, as the time went on, I, I suppose the songs would uh, document the history of the time. Looking back at them mm. now, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think you could probably do. I don't know if anyone's ever done a, a, a degree or a PhD on this, the music of the Sands family. But I mean, it would be an interesting thing to kind of trace some of the the words that you've sung and the yes. time and history. You know, there has been some PhDs done on various aspects. All right, mm. and in fact, there's a man did a PhD on a song I wrote called "The Mixed Marriage," wow. and the. Uh, it's about day, uh, let's see. Remember the first day? Uh, the first, one of the first folk songs I heard on the on the radio, come out of a wet battery at wireless, was a song which went, uh, There's a frog in the curtain and he did riding. There's a frog in the curtain and he did riding. There's a frog on a curtain and he to ride with a sword and a pistol by his side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Song about a frog getting married to a mouse. <laughs> and I thought that must have been very complicated. <laughs> Certainly from a psychological <laughs> viewpoint. <laughs> Never mind the physiological side <laughs> of things. But it is the first time I have come across this mixed marriage. Mm. And, and uh, in a song. And uh, the... the uh, of course, that is mixed marriage between a, a, a man and a, well, not between a man and a woman, but, but between a Catholic and a Protestant. Mm. Oh, lady, can I take you walking? We'll get married then. Maybe we can do some talking. We'll get married then. First I know, I must. First I must know where you come from. Where do you go for Sunday morning? What foot do you dig with, darling? We'll get married then. We'll get married then, we'll get married then When Santa Claus shaves off his whiskers We'll get married then When the Pope allows divorce We'll get married then This lodge King Billy from his horse And we'll get married then Oh, you're so full of bigotry Your narrow eyes they cannot see Why can't you be more like me? We'll get married then, and so on. Wow, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> so, it, it is about, uh, actually, there's a friend of mine who, who did a, a PhD uh, surrounding the song okay. and uh, the differences and uh, wow. that yeah, type of yeah. thing. It's uh, lots of stuff in that song, King Billy, and which foot do you kick with? And, y yes, yes, and yes. And the distance between your eyes and, you know, all these y yes. kind of uh, caricatures that were you know, fired over at the other side from one exactly. to the other. Um, so you, you know, obviously very early, it sounds like you understood that the, there was a kind of a power in music. And even I was just, we were interviewing Stephen Travers earlier from the Miami show band. Yes, and, Stephen, I know and, very well. And, and, man. You know, Stephen talking about how music somehow had the, has the capacity to take us to another place. He's, Stephen said music was the, is the one thing that he can do that takes him back to his life before his friends were all murdered, you know, in the Miami show band, you mm -hmm. know, murder music takes him back. It's the only thing that can actually bring his old life back, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, other than that, it, it, life has never been the same for him. And, 
you've obviously realized that and and for over 30 years you've been running events called the music of healing mm. and uh we host uh, them often here in our building uh, in Ancoon and for me i think they're incredible events uh you bring often you bring politicians from one you know one from each side, well a protestant and a catholic say or a unionist and a nationalist um you've this year you had a british soldier uh and uh and a victim of the troubles um uh, a republican a, activist a republican well, activist yes. and, mm -hmm. a, and a former british soldier uh, you've had all kinds um as well as church leaders you had um i've had muhammad al husseini a muslim sheikh and uh, reverend um jim mcconnell yes. from whitewell metropolitan church kind of uh you've you've had all kinds um uh where did t so you, what what some of, what would be some of the kind of most significant moments you can remember of those music of healing events i think actually the song uh the, the title of the event and uh, you mentioned in, here in Ancoon mm -hmm. it's such a wonderful place to have it mm -hmm. because as soon as you walk through that door you feel somehow comfortable and everyone mm. who comes here would, would say that Johnny and mm. yourself and Jan have done a, an amazing job here you know uh, absolutely mm. but I, I as a result of a song I wrote There Were Roses uh, I met up with Pete Seeger and Pete uh, and myself wrote a song called The Music of Healing and uh, I remember going up to see him back in the early 80s and I admired, I had admired Pete for years and I was delighted to meet him uh, and uh, I remember myself and Catherine and Fanon and Maya Fanon and Maya were very young five, four that sort of age and I remember we got to the end of Pete's lane in the snow and Pete says don't attempt to drive up my lane mm -hmm. in the car that you have uh, he had a four wheel drive. So. Mm -hmm. This is in America. In, in America, America, yes, okay, yes. Yeah, in, yeah, the yeah. Hud, in the uh, high banks of Hudson River up by, uh, okay. by uh, Poughkeepsie uh, okay. up there. And uh, Pete, I remember Pete put his arms, he embraced the four of us in one embrace. <laughs> He's a big man. He's a tall guy, wasn't he? Very, very tall. tall yeah, very yeah. tall. So we went up and uh, we stayed several days, but I remember. At breakfast one morning, he says, does anybody know a song about toast? <laughs> I says, now that you mention it, I don't think I do. <laughs> he says, well, let's write one then. So I started to write songs about toast and write songs about everything. And in the midst of that, uh, we're talking about music and how music can help to heal wounds, not only between two people or tribes, but between the conflicts mm -hmm. in one's own head. Mm. And... I said to Pete, you know, someone should write a song about that. Pete mm. says, you write it. <laughs> so I was back up sometime later in the United States, back up in the Hudson. I called up to see him and I sang him the song that I had written. And uh, he stood up all, he's six foot two inches and looked out through the window at the Hudson below and he said, it's good, but I could hear a but coming. Mm -hmm. He says, it's good, but... It's too short. It mm. needs another verse. <laughs> I says, you write it, <laughs> which he did. And we mm. recorded the song together. And I'll sing you a little bit of it, will I? Yes, yeah, yeah. I love that song. Because it sort of leads in, into the events in a way. Mm. Mm. children don't sing the songs about winning and losing sit down beside me the green fields are bleeding sing me the music of healing sing me a song of a lover returning the darker the night the nearer the morning bring me the news for a new day that's dawning sing me the music Hearts 
is a wonder Stronger than the guns of thunder Even when we're torn asunder Love will come again Sometimes the truth's like a hair in the cornfield You know that it's there But you can't put your arms round it All we can hope is to follow its footprints Sing me the music of healing and Who'd have thought I could feel so contented To learn I was wrong After all of my rambles I've learned to be heard And I've learned how to tremble Sing me the music of healing Ah, oh, the heart's a wonder Stronger than the guns of thunder Torn asunder, love will come again. Mm. It's a little bit of it anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. So we yeah. were having the, the events that we had here in on Kuhn. We started off actually the first year. I remember unionists weren't speaking to Republicans. And I think the one of the first meetings of that uh, I asked Mary McAleese to, if she mm-hmm. would chair it. The um, former president of Ireland. Yeah. Exactly. She went on mm-hmm. to become president after that. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> At that point, she wasn't. Yeah. No, 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 no. She wasn't. Yeah, yeah. And she had been a resident in Ross Yes. Right? Yeah, in yeah. fact, Siobhan O'Dwyer, who writes plays here, great mm-hmm. woman, Siobhan. She had uh, myself and uh, Mary as two long lost lovers <laughs> meeting up in a a hotel and the, I was the she was a sanitary inspector and I was a rat catcher <laughs> but Mary was great and well I mean she's a great woman but she also knew all the issues mm. I mean she came from Belfast uh, mm. but uh, very she knew all the issues very intelligent bright woman so she chaired it and uh, yeah the first two people uh, one from the Republican side, one from the Unionist side. Francie Malloy from Tyrone was uh, from Sinn Féin and Roy Garland, mm. who had literally the biography and Gusty Spence. Roy was there too. So then uh, we we did it in the Methodist Hall, which is now the a restaurant actually, mm-hmm. uh, one year. And then we moved here and it's really fantastic. I, th- I think one of the, I remember... An early one was David Irvine and Bernadette Devlin were to come, but Bernadette couldn't come. At the last minute, she couldn't come. So I was left with two chairs, but only one filled. Mm-hmm. And I had questions for David Irvine and questions for Bernadette mm-hmm. Devlin. And uh, I I said to David, I've got questions for you, but I've got questions for Bernadette Devlin. Could you handle them? Mm-hmm. Could you answer them as if you were Bernard mm-hmm. the Devlin? Mm-hmm. And he gave a bit of a laugh. Mm-hmm. He says, throw them at me. Mm-hmm. So he was brilliant. Mm. He, says, he spoke from the point of view of someone, wow. a Catholic growing up in Tyrone, uh-huh. uh, lots of unemployment, mm-hmm. all that. Uh, and then he says, I would have said to, uh, and the Protestants had all the power, mm. and I would have said to Bernard that I had no power. A uh, working class Protestants had no power. Yeah. Uh, so that's know, amazing in the sense of that's an amazing idea for a to do an event like that where you yeah. ask a politician to to literally empathise with the other side. Uh, what would what would the other person say? Like I would love to hear, you know, <laughs> Jeffrey Donaldson or you know, tell us what you know yeah, yes. the other side would say. Yeah. Um, it's a, an amazing. David Irvine was a very significant leader here, obviously at the time. He, of the he was, I, and I I got to know him, uh, and I like him uh, very much. Uh, one other one, well, they're, they're all memorable for me, but one was we decided to give an award, a, a Creative Arts Award, which mm-hmm. we do here, mm-hmm. as you know, uh, and it we we wanted to give it to Pete. Mm. And Pete wasn't able to travel. He was getting on in years. 
uh, but his grandson Tao came over and uh, I knew that Jerry Jerry Adams is a big you know a, a fan of the music of Pete Seeger and uh, I decided to invite Jerry Don to make the presentation but I also was aware that Pete would want a, a wide embrace mm. and uh, I asked Jeffrey Donaldson and uh, I said Jerry Adams is coming and uh, Jeffrey said he says I'll come because you're a neighbour but don't ask me to shake hands with Jerry Adams he talked about his uncle's been shot by the IRA and so on and uh, I told Jerry this and he said well I've got two bullets in me still from a, uh, from a loyalist gun mm. but they came and they uh, they both uh, talked about uh, well that po that some poetry and read poetry and uh, mainly about people who were killed were friends of theirs killed and I didn't ask them to shake hands and there's a television camera there from the news to see if they would but at the end Tao got up and he started to sing a song written by his grandfather where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls pick them, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? And the song went on. And suddenly I realised both Jeffrey and Jerry were singing along and humming along with the song. And there were tears in people's eyes and people were saying afterwards, it doesn't matter if they don't shake hands, if they can sing a chorus of a song together which somehow acknowledges the pain generally besides their own pain. Because it's very difficult for politicians to agree sometimes when the only opportunity they're given to talk to each other is on television. Mm. And you put on two rival politicians together on television news and if they don't fight with each other they won't be invited back mm -hmm. with each other. Because television is about moving pictures mm. Television is difficulty in dealing with peace. You put a cam C in a blue sky on a television screen. People will be reaching for their remote controls for storms. So it is a very important moment in a way. And I think in many ways it is unconscious they're joining in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the chorus of a song, you can agree mm. without losing face. Mm. Mm. And later when we went to Stormont for, for the, uh, the, well, actually it was just before that, for the Good Friday Agreement it was in danger of faltering and uh, the politicians were very nervous. They were worried about, not about their opponents, were worried about the supporters. And the way I remember it, it's like two buses meeting in a narrow bridge and neither driver dared give way in case he would let down his passengers. And it's only when the passengers would get up and go to the driver and say, look, it's okay. You can go back a bit because we all must go forward. So we went up to Stormont that day. It's just beginning to rain. And we needed a song we brought uh, children from both sides of the divide and uh, musicians and, mu and musical instruments, lambeg drums. And Near the cellist of Sarajevo. And the cellist of Sarajevo, Vedran, Vedran Smilovic. Vedran, uh, an amazing character. Uh, he had played for the... Uh, well, he lived in Sarajevo during the siege. 22 of his friends got killed standing in a bread line waiting for food 
And Smilovich believed that music was the opposite to despair. And every day, for 22 days, he went out and played the Albanoni Adagio. And a CNN reporter ran out of the flight check and said, Mr. Smilovich, you're not crazy for playing your cello while they shell Sarajevo. Smilovich says, you ask me if I'm crazy for playing my cello while they shell Sarajevo. Why don't you ask them? Are they not crazy for shelling Sarajevo while I play the cello? <laughs> and it made an awful lot of sense. Mm. But we take it for granted that uh, cameras go to wars. Mm. Uh, I think the Iraq war, uh, the, the situation room, if that's the right word for it, in Iraq, it was produced by a, a Hollywood producer. Mm. Uh, so when the man in the news says, here is the news, it's selected pieces to attract the eye of the viewer very often and the purse of the advertiser very often. And a lot of the great things that are happening every day, everywhere, would never make it mm. uh, onto a, a, a news program. Mm. So we decided to create a storm for the six o'clock news. Mm. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you write a song, uh, you could spend years at it. And all the times you have to write it in two minutes. And I knew that we'd get five seconds, at least, if we would, on the news. And we wanted to, I suppose, transport our hopes back to people at home who have been watching so many television interviews of people who disagreed with the talks. And uh, so I put, I put a very simple chorus together. And uh, went, yeah. Carry on, carry on You can hear the people singing Carry on, carry on Till peace will come again We're standing by the castle In the hopeful Belfast breeze with a new song for your table To try again for peace Carry on, carry on We'd hardly been singing for five minutes when the door opened and out walked Mo Molum and all the politicians wow. And it is fantastic And they, they come along and clapping their hands along to it and I say would you sing the chorus with me and I sing carry on and they say carry on they're a bit nervous and then the women's coalition come out and they started singing they weren't a bit afraid carry on carry on carry on carry on you can hear the people singing carry on carry on needed a verse because a lot of people were objecting to the agreement because it was compromise it was betraying the birthright of your children so we needed a verse for that don't betray your children's birthright well that's a right to stay alive for there is no greater treachery than to let your children die. Carry on, carry on, you can hear the people singing. Carry on, carry on, till peace will come again. Remember leaving? Storming that day, and the children were very excited. And the politicians went back in again. They'd stay there all night. Come out the next morning with an agreement. And, uh, you know, we saw where peace could be like a little child that will slip and stumble mm. many times before he learns to walk. Mm. But we believed and still do that there are enough helping hands to make sure that. It will dance mm. one day. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was a, a amazing thing you did, and it, we have the video footage of it in the Guardians of the Flame documentary. You know where. You, You've got Catholic school and Protestant school kids who now must be um, 20, uh, 30, something, you know. Yes, yes. They were literally the future of the country, yes. you know. Uh, some of yes. them, I mean, we've got elected MPs now that are in their 30s, you know. So, I mean, yes. um, that's right. Uh, and, and I think there, you know, there is something very profound about um, singing about a future, you know. I always often use the quote that was talked about Father Jerry Reynolds from Clonard Monastery at his funeral. They said he was like a man that came from the future. And uh, and it was because even though he was living on the Falls Road in the heart of Republican West Belfast, he every day would walk up and down the Shankill, a loyalist, the heart of loyalist Belfast. And uh, he, he was a man who brought people together. And I suppose... In a way, when you create music, you're you're kind of singing from the future. You're like a, a songwriter from the future. You're imagining what the future could look like if, the, if these walls didn't exist. And it seems to be what you've often you've been able to do. You even where where have all the flowers gone? You know, Jeffrey Donaldson and Jerry Adams both singing together. Mm. They wouldn't shake hands together, but they they could kind of agree to the sentiment of the song that. You know, it's not good yes. for people to die in war. Yeah. Um, they could sing that word. They couldn't probably speak it from a podium, you know, but they could. Exactly. They could, so music somehow does something different. Yes, it brings us into another place, I think, Johnny. Mm. Uh, you know, I think very often people regard music or art as a luxury, and very often it's the first to be cut. Mm. But I think it's not. I think it's essential Mm. for our everyday living to be mm. able to get into the uh, beyond uh, the rational arguments or the logic because logic uh, it's words a use of words but when it becomes reasonable to despair as Seamus Heaney says walk on air mm. against your better judgment Mm. So, well, I think there are certain situations that we come up against. Maybe someone very close to you dying. Uh, you can't deal with that in a normal, rational way. Mm. You must go into another place. Maybe the first song ever sung was sung to the Creator, mm. to uh, to a place where words wouldn't reach mm. but only with song it, it would work mm. I often think the you know my mother's my father's mother came from the Irish speaking hills of Cooley and uh, you know I grew up with a lot of stories my father had a lot of stories my mother too old stories old well you call them prehistory but almost like an Old Testament of stories or truths from our tradition. And, uh, you know, many of these stories would, uh, facts and figures would change in time and telling, but they, retra they retained a truth within mm -hmm. them, like some old secret cure for the future. Mm. And uh, in fact, the very first song ever sung in Ireland, mm -hmm. according to the old books, the mm -hmm. old stories, uh, was sung in 500 BC. Mm -hmm. It is a literature, if you like, from here long before Chaucer mm -hmm. was heard of. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the kind of learned speculation about these things would say it was possibly the 5th century. But the story surrounding it is about the, 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 uh, Ireland. Was, it wasn't even called Ireland at the time, of course. Uh, but it is inhabited by spirit people. And uh, these were, well, there's lots of stories about the spirit people coming here, angels from heaven. Uh, some of them, they weren't too good. When the row started between mm -hmm. Michael, the archangel, mm -hmm. and your man, 
uh, Lucifer, uh, there was uh, good angels, like so all the good angels back here, and Lucifer, bad angels behind me. And uh, but there were a crowd of angels that sort of sat on the the wall, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. In fact, they wanted God and the devil to shake hands, above all things, mm -hmm. which was a, a very risky thing to do. And uh, anyway, Michael tipped them all out over the hedges down to hell, the bad boys. And then he saw the boys sitting on the wall. Oh, over you go too. And God, in his infinite mercy, happened to be walking past at the time, and he says, hey, they're, they're not all that bad, are they? <laughs> and they... Uh, Michael says, do you think not? And so God pulled a lever and stopped stopped them halfway between heaven and hell, which happened to be the earth. And as it happened, the Ireland was facing upwards at the time and they arrived in Ireland. So this is one of the stories. And they, they were called the two of the Danon. And these spirit people had three Goddesses, princesses, Banba, Fulu, and Erin. And they, they, they were out for a walk one morning, admiring the beauty of the landscape and the power of the ocean. And they heard an extra swish in the waves. And what was it but a boatload of humans, <laughs> above all people? And they, the human said, can we come in? And they said in one voice, providing you call the place after us. Now, the poetic names for Ireland to this day uh, are Banba and Fuller. And the name of the land itself is Erin. Mm. So, all right, you can come in. Mm -hmm. But the two of the Dan says, no, it doesn't work as handy as that. Mm -hmm. We have to prepare a welcome for you. Go back beyond the ninth wave. The ninth wave is a, mm -hmm. the sacred wave. And we'll prepare a little kid, Mila Falce, for you. Well, the welcome they prepared, it was a storm. Mm -hmm. Blew the boats up in the air uh, like matchsticks. And the, uh, the, two, the, the Malaysians, for those who they were, mm -hmm. they started to panic. And they called upon their chief bard, Amrigin, or Aurigin, means born of song. He said, sing the song, save us. So his voice rose up to meet the storm. And it's supposed to be the first song ever sung in Ireland. And it was first written down by the monks in the 8th century and it is in the old Irish the first verse I'll sing as best as I can in that old Irish Side. I'm a stag of seven battles I'm a wild bull in Valar Wild bull in Valar I'm a tail that fall by the sun I'm a lake in the emerald plain I'm a salmon in the river deep For stone. 
bones on the mountain Oh, if not I know the moon and the secrets of some sand Oh, if not I know the secret of things that are silent Not I am the tree and the lightning that strikes it. If not I am the song and the singer that sings it. If not I am the storm and the camera of storms. The camera and it's a tremendous piece mm. of, of uh, writing and scholars have been working trying to figure this out mm -hmm. for years and uh, a lot of what people would say generally even though it's a very very old song it's about many ways what's happening today mm -hmm. it's that alliance the connection the interconnection mm -hmm. between cre all creation mm -hmm. and the creator mm -hmm. but all creation uh, Pope Benedict talked about if we injure the earth we are injuring mm -hmm. God's creation mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there's echoes of some of those words in some ancient uh, Hindu texts. And of course, echoes, uh, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people said it is a boast, but it was, it's not a boast at all. Mm. It's an acknowledgement of the unity and interconnectedness of the soul and all of creation mm. and uh, anyway I'm not too sure how we got onto there yeah <laughs> I, I it it sound, it was it followed at the time I think it's good you know I mean I think I, I think what you're touching on is I find very significant I think in a time where certainly from myself coming from a Christian tradition uh, we have found it very easy to fall into a dualistic world or a binary world um, kind of a sacred and secular and we care about the sacred but the earth we don't I mean it's very Greek it's Plato um, Plato said there were the you know, the heavens and then there's the earth and the earth er, the heavens are sacred and the earth is is profane you know is, is just not to be worried about really mm, mm -hmm. um, but that's not that's not the Hebrew tradition the Hebrew tradition is much more of this sense of of interconnectedness, as, mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, and and I think you know I think in many faiths, and I certainly speak as a Christian, I think what we need to do is recover that sense of uh, of uh, as Mother Teresa said, we belong to each other. So uh, enemies belong to each other, but also um, as we look at the world, it's not the humans are the are the only things we care about, and we don't care about the. The forests in Australia, you know, mm -hmm. we that somehow they are all connected. Yes, um, yes. And um, I wonder, there's so much we could talk about, but um, just when we're talking about music and its capacity to heal, um, I always found a story that you tell about your experiences of uh, working in prisons in America um, mm. uh, quite moving of how you use music to reach out to um people in a in a an american prison who um uh, you know who wouldn't have had an appreciation of music wouldn't have known how to write a song um how did that happen what what was the story behind that i was playing one night in a place called st louis mm -hmm. or is it st louis mm -hmm. in missouri mm -hmm. or is it missouri mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was after the concert this tall blonde woman walked up to me and she says, hey, would you like to come with me to Reno? Mm -hmm. I says, what had you in mind? Like, 
And it turned out that her name was Jill Berryman, who is the director of the Sierra Arts Foundation in, in Reno, Reno, in Nevada. And she thought that because many of my songs came from a background of conflict, that there might have some relevance in the the gangland prisoner community mm-hmm. in Reno. And uh, so I went out there for several weeks and played in, in prisons and I met people with very sad stories, hard, hard stories. And one place uh, that I always remember is a place called Wittenberg Hall in Reno, but it's, it's really a, a young people's prison. Mm. But it's very much of a prison. I mean, there were people with chains in their ankles mm. and uh, there were people as young as 11 year old. And uh, they had, uh, they were very closed, but uh, sang a few songs and suddenly it awakened something inside them mm. and they became much more open. And one of the judges came in there with me, a woman called Frances Doherty, uh, with a Scottish Irish connection. And uh, Frances was, her job was to decide where these young people should go into an adult prison, where if there weren't criminals going in, they would be coming out. Mm. Or should they go to a drug rehabilitation place or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said sometimes it's very hard to tell because they're very closed and so on. And uh, I said, if we could get them to write a song about their own life, would you accept that as a plea in their defence? Mm-hmm. And Francis knew about music. Words on their own can reach to the ends of the earth, but words on the wings of a song can soar higher and seep deeper, and reach further inside to express hurt or pain or even hope. And she said, if you can get them to write a song about their own life, I'll accept that as mm-hmm. a plea. And I went in the next morning, and uh, even though I've been writing songs for years, I had no idea how to teach anyone how to write a song. (laughs) But it's amazing what that mixture of terror and adrenaline (laughs) can create when you're standing in front of 80 or 90 fairly tough kids. But they were very helpful. And uh, we decided there would be three verses in the song. There would be, and we went through everything. Uh, the first verse would be about the past, second about the present, third about the future. And we went through every line, four lines, first verse, first line, where were you born? Second line, what was it like? Third line, what is your family like? Fourth line, would you like to go back to that? Mm. And I said, don't worry about rhyming anything. Mm. That's, that's a joke. That's the easiest part. Mm-hmm. Just write a sentence, answer the question. Where were you born? I was born here. What was it like? And so on. So I started to write. And uh, I had to find a melody that everybody could sing. And I thought about who, what song would everybody in America know? Mm-hmm. thought about Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. They'll know Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. Most of them never heard Mm. of Elvis Presley. Mm. The only Mm. song they all knew in common was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Mm. And their, maybe their culture life had ended very young. And uh, this big guy came up and he says, listen, Baba, I ain't going to sing no Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Mm. No judge. He says, well, he's very big. I said, do you know the words of, or the air of Come By Ya? He says, yeah, bro, mm-hmm. that's a good song. I says, well, actually, it's the same melody as mm-hmm. Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which it is. Sing it. It's a song that she sang to the judge. I was born in Stanford on the bay, 
Seems so long now, so far away. There were pretty flowers all around. But I grew up, but I grew down. Will you hear me? Will you hear me? When I was only very young, my dad left home before my life begun. He only wanted passion drugs. My mama cried and she gave me hugs. Will you hear me? Will you hear me? My youngest brother, he got killed Right beside our favourite hill He came and took my dad away And I locked him up in Reno jail When I was eight, we moved to Dayton That's where I learned that word called hatin' When I was ten I ran away My man grandma cried all day I sold my body to buy my food I was beaten, bullied and abused Will you help me turn the page? I'm a girl of seventeen years of age Sometimes I get a letter from Danielle She's got a little girl of her own and I think about another song to the same melody. And I think about herself and the little girl. I see trees of green, red roses too. They bloom for me and they bloom for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I hear children cry, I watch them grow To learn much more than I'll ever know I think to myself, what a wonderful world Well, thank you Tommy for your time and um, we really, I say this most interviews, you can keep going like I, I feel like we could uh, make this a 10 part series maybe <laughs> well you got a few things out of me johnny that yeah, had been yeah. lying asleep yeah. for a long time yeah. or maybe had never been awakened yeah 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 but um we we uh are very appreciative of you and katrine and and uh your family and it's a, a real joy to be neighbors and um and i th i hope in this interview we have touched on not just the fact that music heals but that we as we allow ourselves to play music and, and create music we can become people that kind of become conduits for healing in the world um i was listening to a, a i had a four-hour journey yesterday I was, I was going to a a funeral and um listening to a, a a christian theologian who talked about the cross and how he said you know many christians today we we want to learn about how to pray and how to feel god's presence and so one of these disciplines of of um contem contemplative prayer for instance and he said but the reality is um we kind of maybe put kind of connecting with god on a much higher plane than we do connecting with other people mm. and he said we actually need to learn disciplines of how to connect with other people not just how to kind of connect in prayer um, and uh, it really kind of struck me and he said one of the disciplines that he has chosen to do is that when he walks into a room he looks for the person who seems most kind of left out you know most uh, maybe on their own no one's talking to and he's made a discipline in his life every time he'll look for the person he'll go to that person walk up to them put out his hand and say hi I'm Richard this is a guy called Richard Beck mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought that's an amazing discipline you know because um, we often think about, uh, you know, practices to make us lose weight, practices to give us, the, you know, the better life. You know, mm -hmm. I found that very interesting. And and he said, you know, the, we often wonder where God is. And he says the cross should tell us where God is. It, he sees it like a compass. The cross was Jesus outside a city hanging between two criminals um being found guilty for a crime he didn't commit you know uh, and he says so if you want to know where god is he's probably with 
the criminals. He's probably outside the city. He's probably a guilty guilty of injustice, you know, or a victim of injustice. Mm, and mm, uh, mm, mm. and I think somehow that when I kind of reflect on a lot of your music and your songs, um, you've found a way to identify in many ways the people that matter you, you kind of um, through music you kind of profile this person like danielle there or you've got the you've written the other song about uh, the girl from japan from the, the uh, Suzaku, yeah, uh, yeah. from uh, yeah. hiroshima was it yes uh, yes 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 um, little girl who is uh, yeah paper cranes yeah yes yeah. yes yes and uh, there were roses about two victims of the troubles uh, and i think there is something, you know, I think you do it beautifully. You kind of orient us to where the other person is um, instead of just kind of songs that make us feel good about ourselves, just songs that will connect us to someone else and move us in that direction. And um, so I, I, I love the fact that we do the music of healing every year in our place, you know, because uh, we get to kind of be just sit there and watch as you gather enemies together, not necessarily always active enemies, but people who would see things in a different way and you mm, put them on a stage mm. and instead of saying, give us your five minute political speech, you're like, mm, mm. tell us your story, you know? Mm, I, and mm. I often use that phrase, you know, your identity is what makes you different. Your story is what makes you the same. And, and I guess music of healing, you give people the chance to tell their stories and everyone kind of ends up watching and thinking those two politicians are really just the same, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I I appreciate your music and and what you've done and thanks for sp spending this uh, time with us. I've probably taken a lot of your time, uh, Johnny. I've enjoyed it very much. I, I've never sat in such a comfortable seat to play the guitar. <laughs> I hope it is okay because yeah, it's really yeah yeah. It's very, you very can have wee, we can have a wee nap now. I wouldn't mind a wee nap you know, <laughs> myself. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure people listening uh, or watching this, um, you might want to get some of your music you can probably find it in different kind of uh places but tommysands.com is one of those places that's right and your new album which is actually a really good album uh fair play to you all um uh is uh is, is just brilliant we listen to it in the car all the time it's currently in my car as we speak my youngest son my eight-year-old always says put number five on i think it's number five the one about jerusalem oh and, yes uh, and uh, it's brilliant. Oh, we could have talked about Jerusalem, but anyway, we won't we won't go there. Um, but oh, just all all that to say, yeah, thanks for your time, Tommy. And uh, uh, well, I'm sure we'll have many more chats in the future. Johnny, the pleasure is mine, and you're a musician yourself. And I think yeah. music is it can be used like a hand or a fist, I suppose. But basically, it's about harmony. Mm. And uh, thank you, Johnny. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.